Welcome to our In the Word Bible study. This evening, I need your help. Because this evening, uh, how many persons here like tests? If you like tests and uh, exams of any kind, let me see your hands. Nobody? Nobody? Well, this evening, you're all going to be very disappointed because uh, I got a test for you all. But the interesting thing about this test, right? Don't scare it. I can show you the questions first. Right? And then throughout the study, you can answer the questions for you. And then at the end, you will get a chance to answer the questions. Is that good for everybody? We, we kind of can work with that. But you're not seeing the questions long enough that you can remember them, do you know? It's just, just a matter of getting you acquainted to what I might ask, you know, and start on this test. And I also need your help because Bible study is all about interaction. So therefore, I, I, if you have any questions about anything I say, you can ask. Stop me, ask a question, raise your hand, do whatever you want. I'll try to answer that question for you this evening. So first of all, can I have the questions, please? Here are the questions. I don't want them up long enough that you can remember them. Can we move on to the next set? All right. Go back to the first set, please. Alison, go back to the first set. I need to get down. I don't feel so good out here. Uh, right? Good. Move on, Alison, please. I don't want no taking pictures. <laughs> no picture, no picture photography is allowed. You understand? Good. So, take them down, please. Thank you. You all, you all get more than when you were going to school. When you were going to school, to so give you a test and tell you, you didn't even know you were coming for the exam. So, I need somebody to help me this evening. I need somebody to read Psalm 91 for me, please. So, who's going to volunteer to read Psalm? Oh, Paula, Paula's going to read it. Can we have a mic here for Paula so that she can read? I want, you can read whatever verse you're comfortable with. Uh, Psalm 91. I'm going to read the New King James Version. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Now the, my study this evening will come from Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. When we were in Bible school, we would say we would exegete this passage. Basically, what it means, we will go through this passage and pull out some truths for you this evening that I believe that you can apply to your life. And don't forget the test at the end. Right? So, and I want everybody to pass this test. So I'd be very careful to go through it slowly so that you'll be able to answer the questions at the end. So Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. On him I lean and rely, and in him confidently trust. Now the authorship of this psalm is in question. There are some who believe that David wrote this psalm, 
There are others that believe that Moses wrote this psalm, but really and truly, they don't know. So the, the author of this psalm is a person called Unknown, a very close relative to Anonymous. So therefore, the author of this psalm is unknown. So if you get this on the test, then you should be able to answer it. The rich promises of this whole chapter, or this whole psalm, is dependent upon one meeting exactly the conditions of these first two verses. I'll say that again. The rich promises of this whole chapter are dependent upon one's meeting exactly the conditions of these first two verses. So let's look at verse number one. He who dwells in the secret place of the most high. The word dwells in this context means to abide as, perma as a permanent resident or to inhabit for a time, to live in a place, to have habitation for some time or permanence. So to dwell means to abide as a permanent resident. So he who dwells is he who abides as a permanent resident in the Most High. Now the secret place of the Most High, this speaks to God's presence or the Holy of Holies or nearness to God. So the secret place speaks to God's presence or the Holy of Holies or nearness to God. Remember in the tabernacle there was a special place that only the high priest could have entered which was called the Holy of Holies, which many believe is where the, the, the spirit and the presence of God exists or rests or relies. So I hope you're, you're with me so far. Now, let's look at some characteristics of one who dwells in God's secret place. Some characteristics of one who dwells in God's secret place. One, he or she is at rest in God. He or she is at rest in God. <clears throat> Excuse me. He or, <clears throat> excuse me a minute. <clears throat> Let me apologize. I mean, I take a few water breaks. <clears throat> the voice is under some pressure. So he who rests is one who rests in God. One who finds his home in God. Remember we talked about the, the secret place to abide is to have permanent residence. And permanent residence means that you are comfortable in God's presence. Now, we can, we can go on to say the person, he or she is at service with God. And I put service with God because I believe that when we are serving, when we are in service, we are working with God and God is working with us. So I know some people say we are working for God, but God is also working with us to help us in service. So the person who dwells in God's secret place is an individual who is in service with God. So if you want to dwell in God's presence, then you should be doing something consistently for the Lord. If you want to abide in the Holy of Holies, you must be working for the Lord. He or she is one who worships God. Now worship and prayers are two separate things. You praise God for what he has done but you worship him for who he is. So when we're talking about worship, we are not talking about what God has done for us. We're talking about who he is. And we're talking about this individual as one who worship God for who he is. So if God had done nothing for you, nothing at all for you, and you find something in you to pray, to give him thanks for, that's worship for who he is. Because God is God all the time. God is God. And he deserves our worship. And sometimes we, we, we confuse the two, worship and prayers, and we confuse the two. But really and truly, worship is just, it's just thanking God for who he is. For the awesome God that he is. And not for anything that he has done for you. He or she loves to be alone with God. To dwell in God's presence means you love to be alone with him. My question is, do you have alone time with him? Alone time that you separate. A time when you separate and that is a time when you say, I am going to spend this next two hours or three hours or one minute or two minutes with the Lord. If you want to dwell in his presence, you have to spend some time alone with him and be comfortable with him. The more comfortable you are in his presence, the more able you are to converse and hear him speak to you. I hear people saying that God does not speak. I disagree. God speaks. 
The point is this, are we tuned in to the channel? Are we tuned in to him? And the person who dwells in characteristic, the last one, he loves to converse with God in solitude. He loves to converse with God in solitude, which is vitally important. So again, when we talk about the characteristics, we're looking at one who rests in God, one who's at home in God, one who's in service with God, one who worships God, one who loves to be alone with him, and finally, one who converses with him in solitude. I'm going over this because this might come up again shortly. So, continuing verse 1. Shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand. Now, this part, whose power no foe can withstand, that's the Amplified Version. And just a, a, a by note, when... I believe that when, when you're studying the Word of God, one version of the Bible that's very helpful in breaking down things or expanding things for you further to give you a clear understanding is the Amplified. The Amplified breaks out the words and gives you a clear understanding. And why is that important? Because, like I said on Sunday morning, people are twisting the Word of God to say what they want it to say and not what the Word of God is saying. So therefore, Bible study is essential because then we're able to break down the Word of God for ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to teach us which you should do. So what does shadow mean? Shadow mean here means protection, shelter, favor. Shadow means protection, shelter, favor. To be covered by one shadow, one has to be very close to that person. To be covered by one shadow, one has to be very close to that individual. Why that is very, very important this evening because we are talking about a person, again, who is comfortable and abiding and dwelling permanently. If you're not comfortable with an individual, then you really and truly not want to be very close to them. So if you want to be in the shadow of the Almighty, you have to be very close to who he is and where he exists and what he loves doing. So when we talk about the shadow, we are talking about one who is very close to the person. And in this case, that person is God. When we are in the shadow of the Almighty, we can expect certain things. When we are in the shadow of the Almighty, we can expect certain things. I'll go through them. One, his protection. When we dwell in the shadow of the Almighty, we can expect God to protect us. God is our defender. God is our defense. And when we dwell in his shadow, we can expect his protection. So therefore, tonight, if you are suffering with fear or you believe that something is going to happen to you, I encourage you to get into God's presence. Because within his presence, we like to say there's fullness of joy, but there's one other thing, there's protection. You can't walk close to God or dwell in God at anything or any danger come to your dwelling. He's not that type of God. Next, when you are in the shadow of the Almighty, you can expect his shelter. Shelter here speaks to security and covering. So when we are in the shadow of the Almighty, we can expect him to cover us. We can expect him to, to be our security. And you think about that for a while. We want to be secure. This is a very turbulent situation, a very turbulent world. Things are happening rapidly. There are all kinds of pestilences and things going around. But when you are in God's shadow, you can expect that he will shelter you and he will protect you from danger, from harm, from accident, from sickness and disease. I was listening this week and they were talking about, um, is it polio? What is it, the thing that in, in uh, St. Lucia? Leprosy, right, leprosy. And they were talking about what leprosy does to an individual. How things begin to fall off. Extremities, fingers, nose, ears, anything external can drop off and how dread a disease leprosy is. And if you're not conscious, immediately the thought comes into your mind, I don't want to catch leprosy. You understand? Nobody wants to. But then what the enemy tends to seek in with is some fear. You then begin to fear. So then you begin to walk around, and if you're not careful, you're watching to see who probably got leprosy. And you take out the leprosy test. You know, you're looking at your eyes. Yeah, you look like you got so somebody sneezing. I remember in COVID, coming out of COVID, 
it was so amazing. Coming out of COVID, you could take off your mask. We have some boy sneeze. It was like, yo, <laughs> serious. I remember some people got in, got in shot for sneezing. It was like, if sinuses, then is this, you know? You can cough, you can sneeze, you can do anything because of the fear. And one of the things I want to tell you tonight is that when we dwell under the shadow of the Almighty, we have a certain level of covering and security that comes with that. We can expect his comfort. We can expect his comfort. And this is important. He's a comforter. The Holy Spirit is a comforter. We can expect his comfort. So to those who are mourning loss of friends, loved ones, or whatever, you can expect God to comfort you in this time. And he comforts you better than any other individual on earth because he knows what you're going through. He understands you what you're going through, and he's able to comfort you at this time. We may think we understand, but only God really knows. So when we are in the shadow of the Almighty, we can expect him to comfort us. But it also means to strengthen us as well. How many people need strength tonight? And I don't mean strength because you're fasting. But I mean strength because you may be feeling weary. It's the middle of the week. You've got two more days to go, and you're not too sure how you're going to make it. You take your hands down. And you don't know how you're going to make it. But sometimes we need to be strengthened. And to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit. We go through very difficult times. Some workplaces are extremely stressful and demanding. And just thinking about work could bring you down. And then thinking about your boss can make you want to resign. But we can expect that in the shadow of the Almighty, that we have that strength. He's our strength. And also, he encourages us. He encourages us. That's what our God does for us. He encourages us. When we feel beat down, when maybe people have been saying things to us that we wish we didn't hear, because they know they're saying sticks and stones will make my bones, but words will not hurt me. I keep saying that person has not heard the words I've heard. But the reality is that God is an encourager. And he's encouraging you right where you are right now, and is encouraging you to continue and to press on. Continuing. When we are in the shadow of the Almighty, we can expect his rest. We can expect his rest. And rest here speaks to peace and to cease from activity. Rest here speaks to peace and to cease from activity. We can expect his peace. The Bible tells us, the peace that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So sometimes our mind is being attacked. The enemy likes to attack our minds. He likes to attack our peace. But we can expect that when we dwell in the shadow of the Almighty, we can expect his peace. So if you seek peace today, seek to dwell in the shadow of the Almighty. And then this one I like very much, we can expect his favor. We can expect his favor. Favor means to afford advantages for success and kindness. Favor means to afford advantages for success and kindness. I once heard TDJ said that favor is not fair. Favor is not fair. But favor is when God promotes you to a position that even you yourself did not expect. When people all around you are questioning how you got where you got to and they're saying some of the most amazing things about you as well. I know he sell drugs. I know what he's doing at night. You don't even know. I know what she's doing. But the reality is the favor of God can move you from a significant to significant in an instant. And when God's favor does that for you, please don't walk around and tell people it's my education. I, I have to wait people, you know, God has done a, a favor with them and they walk around saying, you know, it's because they study real hard. You didn't see me last night. I was doing 12, 20 hours of study. The reality is you know full well that you didn't study in. You know full well that you did nothing to deserve this. And that's what you say. I did nothing to deserve this, but I thank God for his favor. I thank God for his favor. And some of you in here tonight, I'm telling you, God has favored and will continue to favor you and put you in positions you never expected to be in because he wants you to glow. 
He wants you to shine for him. When you get into these positions, let other people know it's because of the favor of God. It is only because of God's favor that I'm able to be where I am right now. And if you think about it carefully, you will go through your life and you would realize there's so many things you didn't deserve. There's so many things that you got that you didn't know how you get. They're up to know you're trying to figure out. It's called the favor of the Lord. It is called the favor of God. And I have seen too many Christians do something that I don't, I just don't understand to do it. God has favored them and blessed them with riches. And they're hiding it. They don't want people to know. They don't want people to know. I don't want a boy to know he got money. Because I have to think, and all these things we do. And instead of giving God credit so that the world will understand what good things God has done, we hide it. We hide it. We don't want people to find out. But I keep saying, when God has favored you, you need to let the world know that it's because of his favor. And you can add on some grace to it if you feel like. So we got that. So once we dwell in God's secret place, we will always abide under his shadow. Once we dwell in God's secret place, we will always abide under his shadow. And remember, to abide means to dwell and have a permanent residence. And to be in one shadow means to be very close to the individual because a shadow is only cast if you are close to the individual or next to them. That's important. Now let's look at verse 2. I will say, the psalmist is here testifying about his God. My question to you tonight is this. Can you say the same things about God as the psalmist? The psalmist is here saying some things and testifying about his God. Can you say these things about your God? That he is my refuge. Can you tonight say that God is your refuge? What is that? My shelter and protection from danger or distress. Is God your refuge tonight? Before you say yet, think about it. Is God your refuge tonight? Is God your protection from danger and distress? Because sometimes when I think about this, I am stressed at times. So if God is my refuge and he is my protection from distress, why am I stressed? Just a thought. Why am I stressed? If he is my refuge, why am I stressed? So, another way you can look at this is refuge, a stronghold which protects by its strength. Any place inaccessible to an enemy. A stronghold, a refuge is any place inaccessible to the enemy. So therefore, when the psalmist was saying, he is my refuge, remember, we don't know if it's psalmist, we don't know if it's David, we don't know if it's Moses, but if you think about it, these two persons are named. Think about the things that these persons went through that they can testify that God is their refuge. I am saying to you tonight that you also have a testimony. God has also been your refuge and your strength. God is your refuge. He has brought you through and he's protected you and he will continue to protect you once you dwell in a secret place. Next, my fortress. So he's my refuge and it seems to be getting stronger and stronger. Now he's my fortress. A forty, any pl fortified place, a fort, a castle, a stronghold, a place of defense and security. So he seems to be getting more and more intense. He goes from refuge to a fortress. He's broadening and expanding the level of the defense. Because I think here that the psalmist is trying to get us to understand that in God, we are what? Safe and secure. Let me say that again. In God, we are safe and secure. Nothing can harm us. Unless we step out of that shadow. Unless we step out of abiding with him. And it is when we step out of abiding with God that things happen. But once we stay very close to God, anything that happens to you happens to you for the reason. And one of the, the only reason that that will be allowed to happen to you is to test you to make you stronger. But never to defeat you and never to break you. And never to cause you to give up. So therefore... When we talk about my God as my fortress, 
it is saying to us tonight that God will protect you to all ends and at all ends. There is nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing that can defeat you because God is your fortress. I don't see, y'all don't seem to be, be, be believing me. But when we are in that secret place of the Most High God, the devil can't harm you. The devil can't touch you. And sometimes I think we give the devil too much credit. Sometimes we talk more about the devil than we talk about what Jesus is doing. I hear people, you know, I remember times ago we were doing some work somewhere and the Lord really moved in a miraculous way. And I remember when we got back to the church hearing people saying, but now we can expect backlash. I get scared when I hear people talking like this. Because if you understand that God is your fortress, why are you even worried about whatever backlash is? The devil can't harm you when you are in his secret place, when you are dwelling in his presence, when you are in the will of God, the devil can't harm you. It's when we step outside of that protection. So if you think about it carefully, if you are well protected in a 45 zone, let's go back to COVID. If in COVID you did what was expected of you, and in most cases you stayed inside and did what was expected of you, they were saying to you that you will not catch COVID. I mean, yeah, some people did, and that can be explained, but the majority of people who follow the protocols, how the protocols were done, were safe. When you did not follow the protocols, you might have exposed yourself to COVID. It's the same thing when we talk about here and God's protection. When we do what God expects us to do, and we dwell and, and obey what he's saying, we are protected. When we step outside just to see how it looks on the outside, we're no longer protected. And I, I talk about me, as you realize, I don't talk about others. I find that sometimes I'm not honest. Because sometimes I know I step outside of his presence. And I do things that I'm not supposed to do. And as a result, there are things that happen to me that should not have happened. But instead of I being honest enough to admit that that's the case, I might sometimes get vexed and say, well, God, you promised to protect me and you didn't. God, you promised to do this for me and you didn't. But the reality is, if I'm being honest, I know that I step outside of what he had for me. And therefore, because I step outside, I expose myself to the forces of darkness. But once I stand within his shadow, next to him and close to him, I can expect his protection. Then he says, my God, my God, the supreme being, Jehovah, the eternal and infinite spirit, the creator, the sovereign of the universe. Think about this for a minute. We have a God that created all of this. We have a God that put all of this in place. If you really want to see how awesome God is, go to the beach. Stand and watch how the water comes in, and it comes to a certain place, and it goes back out. You understand? You want to really be amazed? Think about the wisdom that he gives man to put something in the sky that does not fall down, especially when they're on it. <laughs> Think about these things. Think about the things that, that, that this supreme God that we worship, Jehovah, has done. The eternal and infinite spirit. And, and sometimes we can't understand eternity because we have been born and shaped in time. And therefore, eternity is outside of time and sometimes we don't understand. But God is eternal and from everlasting. And what, what really amazes me about God, he knows everything. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows what's going to happen now. He knows what's going to happen in the next five minutes. But he loves us so much that he doesn't interfere with our choice. Imagine we have such a God that loves us so much that he knows that we can do things like crucify his son. And he didn't intervene because he gave us choice. And choice is the ultimate in love where you have choice. He is supreme. There's no other God like him. I've heard people talk about all the other gods. I've studied some of these religions and stuff. 
and all the religions that I've studied and have looked at, there's no God like our God. Most of them dead. That's where it's going to start out. Most of them dead. And most of them still dead. And probably will remain dead for a long time. But we have a God that is from everlasting to everlasting, has never died and will never die. And yet sometimes I, I think that we, we sit and we don't recognize how awesome it is that a God who created us wants our worship. Imagine the creator is saying to the created, this is what I require of you. He could create angels to worship better than we can. You're aware of that, right? The angels sing, holy, holy, holy. And they said it, it's just better than Paula's voice, I hear. <laughs> but the thing is this, with all these angels, millions of angels around his throne, he still wants to hear the praises and the worship of one of That is the great God that we serve. He's eternal, he's everlasting, but he loves us. And because he loves us, he gives us this opportunity to worship him freely. So you think about it. So when, he, when the, the psalmist is saying, my God, I think he's reflected on his God, how awesome his God is. How awesome he is, how marvelous and wonderful he is, that in spite of who we are, he still loves us. And then, what is our position? Given all that I've just shared before, what is our position? Our position is this, one, to lean. To lean. That means to bend or incline so as to rest on something. To bend or incline so as to rest on something. Our position as children of God is to lean on him. The verse said, lean not on to your own understanding. Lean, are we leaning on him tonight? Are we leaning on him for support, for guidance, and for direction on a daily basis? Or is this just a, something we do once in a while? He wants us to lean on him, to rest on him. Why? Because without him, we can't stand straight. You might think so, but without him, you are nothing. So we need to lean on something stronger. You don't lean on something weaker, you hope not because then you will fall. You lean on something stronger for support. He wants us to lean on him because he wants to support us every day. Next, secondly, our position is to rely. To rely. Our position is to rely. A certainty or full conviction that satisfies the mind and leaves it at rest or undisturbed by doubt. So when we say to rely on him, it means that we do not doubt anything that he has promised to us. We do not doubt anything that he has promised to us. There's a verse in the Bible that, that I, I love. Because it says to us that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears, we know that we should have what we ask of him. So when we ask according to God's will, God will not say no. The thing is this, are we asking according to his will? Because in order to ask according to his will, you've got to know what his will is. So when we talk about rely, we have to be confident and have no doubt that God is who he is. God will provide what he says he will provide. God will do what he says he will do. And it's easy to sing it on Sunday mornings. It's easy to sing it in a Bible study. And it's easy to sing it in church. But God wants us to rely on him outside of these four walls. He wants us to rely on him when things get hot, when things get difficult. Stop asking for five minutes to cuss. It's two minutes now? Oh, it's two minutes now? Well, that's true. Everything escalating. So it's a, yeah, two minutes now to cuss and things like that, you know? He wants us to rely on him to the extent that when difficult circumstances come, we don't ask for two minutes or for an excuse. And then, finally, our position is to trust to trust. So he says lean, says rely, and ultimately he calls us to a position of trust. To place confidence in, to depend on, to believe. That's what trust is. To place confidence in, to depend on, to believe. That's what trust is. When we trust in the Lord, 
with all our heart and lean not to our own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him. He promises to direct our path. Do we trust God tonight? Do we really trust God tonight? Do, have we placed our full confidence in him? That is borne out by our actions. Trusting God is not something you say. Trusting God is something you do. It's like love. Love is not something you say. Love is something you do. Trusting God is something you do. I can know you trust God by seeing your action. Are we trusting God tonight? Are we really relying on leaning on him? Or are we relying and leaning on someone else? Or something else? Tonight he's calling us to trust because he says that when we lean, when we rely, and when we trust, we can then be guaranteed that we shall dwell in the secret place of the Most High God, and these other promises that we talked about tonight shall be yours. Now, yeah, we still got time. To the questions, please. I'm going to give you, because you're such bright people, I'm going to give you, I have eight minutes to seven, so I'm going to give you the next eight minutes to answer these questions. And then we'll come back, and I'll have you share with me what your answers are. So you have eight minutes. So maybe you can now use your cameras to take pictures. <laughs> eight minutes. All right, you have two more minutes. 
two minutes more. I know some people have finished. If you want to consult with the person next to you, you, you can. All right, let's start. Question number one, who wrote Psalm 91? <clears throat> Pardon? The unknown. the unknown. Yeah, get this woman a hand. Okay, good. What does the word dwell in verse one mean? Baby, well, you can't ask. No, no. If you ask one question, you're going to let for somebody else. You're all in the back heard? Huh? You let me hear. So you got, you got. Where's the mics? You got, you got one? To abide permanently. To abide permanently. Anybody else? I gave more than one for dwells. I was, wait, wait, you wait till now to tell me. Remember, I said you could interrupt me at any time and ask me to, re, to slow down, repeat, and say what's going on too fast. I say, a bite permanently is one. I said, to inhabit for a time, to live in a place, to have a habitation for some time or permanence. So it dwells. So thank you. Okay, where can I find the secret place of the Most High? Is it A, St. Michael, B, St. Lucy, or C, Christ Church? <laughs> None of the above. So where can I find the secret place of the Most High? Pardon? God's presence. Okay, good. Or the Holy of Holies. And now we want three people, each one giving me a, a, new, a different characteristic. Highlight three characteristics of a person who dwells in God's secret place. Three different people. So one person will give me one, the next, the next, the next. Three characteristics of a person who dwells in God's secret place. Huh? At service with God. That's one. Um, at rest. That's two. One more. And at home. At home. Okay. You, you had one as well? Go ahead. Huh? Trust. Okay. No. Four. What are three benefits that we can expect? When we are covered by the shadow of the Almighty. Protection. What are three benefits Protection. we can expect? Protection. Protection. One. Shelter. Shelter. Two. Safety. Comfort. Strength. Comfort. Three. Safety and security. What? what? Safety and security. Safety and security. Favor. Strength. Strength. Anything else that you don't want to add? You can add why they have, you know, I didn't say my list was exhaustive. <laughs> peace. Okay, peace. Encouragement. Huh? Okay. Rest. We had to rest already. All right, good. Thank you. Now, list three declarations the psalmist made about the Lord. 
three declarations the psalmist made about the Lord. A refuge. One, he's my refuge. Fortress. My God. My God. Refuge, fortress, and my God. Okay, wonderful. You all are doing great. Now the cross of the matter. Highlight two things you have learned from this evening's study. I want at least six people. God, God is... I can't copy from one another, so uh, good now. So God, six people. God is supreme, and what? I can trust him. Okay, good. That's one. Who else? Right here. Wait, wait, Cheryl? Importance of alone time with God. Uh-huh. All right. That's one thing. <laughs> I said two. That's only one. Well, well, Shara, tell me the importance of a long time with God. Shara, you, you got to give me another one. Two security. things you learned from this evening study. Security. Security. What about security you learned, Cheryl? There is security in God. There's security like in God. Everything. Okay, wonderful. Wonderful. I can't assume we want right answers. Jesus, all right. So what's our teacher would be if you just tell me security? All right, you need four more people. Um, I learned that once you stay in the presence of the Lord, you are fully protected. Uh-huh. That's um, one. And that, back to the one about service, like how important it is to not just work for God, but work with God and the benefits of working with God. All right, good. Three more. Do you want to talk to him, Mike? <laughs> We must be comfortable with God. Mm -hmm. That's only one. I said two things. You all see two. It's a two. It's a two. two. We, we must really know God, know his will. We must really know God and know his will. Okay, two more persons. Wait, the rest of y'all in order and learn that tonight? I'm mean, here for 45 minutes. Y'all in order? You hurt my feelings now? That by dwelling or abiding with God in his secret place of the Most High, that it strengthens our walk and it establishes us and puts us in a place where that no matter what comes against you, that you are not swayed from side to side and that he has your back 100%. Thank you. One more. Maybe. Where the other mic is? They got one here, though. We are safe in his presence. We are safe in his presence. Okay. That's one. You need me, that person. Whoever that person is, owe me another one. Right here. Right here, Pastor Jeff. Well, I said we are secure in his presence. Okay, good. That's two. Thank you. No, I was saying he was, you are fully secured in God's presence. Mm -hmm. Right? And you don't have to fear because God is in perfect control. You can trust him and you can rely on him. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. You all did very well. So let me give you a clap. <laughs> Maybe the next time we have got gifts and prizes, but not tonight. <laughs> so thank you. I just close with this. Let us seek to enter into his secret place through living a life of total obedience to him. Let us seek to enter his secret place through living a life of total obedience to him. God bless you. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs>